Within six years of its inception, the Gestapo had grown from a regional secret police force into a crucial element in the rise and expansion of the Third Reich. Under the guidance of its shadowy director, Heinrich Müller, it had evolved into an instrument of terror whose success in crushing resistance to Hitler was unequaled. By 1939, few people in Nazi Germany dared risk opposing the Führer or the Reich. This was Hitler's primary objective. As it had been so dazzlingly well achieved, he was ready to move ahead unhindered by opposition to the next step of his master plan. The Gestapo was graduating to a new role on a new international stage. I am the man who started the war. An incredible claim. Be cynical if you like, it's true. I was the trigger man who lit the fuse to Europe in 1939. There was a specific incident which began the chain reaction of bloodshed and violence. And of course there had to be one man to engineer the incident. I was that man. The night of the 31st of August, 1939, Eastern Germany. A handful of trucks set out on a secret mission. This was Operation Tannenberg, executed on direct orders from the security chief Reinhard Heydrich and his deputy, head of the Gestapo, Heinrich Müller. Tension had been mounting along the border between Germany and Poland. The German press had reported multiple allegations of Polish provocation, all of them spurious. Alfred Neuox was a security officer under Gestapo command and later was happy to describe the part he played that night. I was directed to go to Gleiwitz with five or six SD men and wait there until I received a code word from Heydrich. Neuox was waiting for the code word, Grandma's dead. When it came, Neuox and his team swung into action. Heydrich said, in order to carry out this attack, report to Muller for canned goods. Canned goods was code for a fresh corpse, which was duly collected. Then Neuox and his men stormed the local radio station on the German side of the border, pretending to be Polish soldiers. They fired a few shots, and a German, speaking in Polish, made a broadcast, urging the local population to rise up against the Nazis. The fake Poles then disappeared, leaving the corpse behind, except he wasn't quite dead. I had him laid down at the entrance to the station. He was alive, but completely unconscious. I tried to open his eyes. I couldn't recognize by his eyes that he was alive, only by his breathing. I didn't see the shot wounds, but there was a lot of blood smeared across his face. He was in civilian clothes. The man was Franciszek Honiok, a German citizen who had been arrested for sympathizing with the Poles. He died where Neuex laid him and would be used as proof of Polish aggression. Walter Schellenberg, a senior spymaster and subsequent head of the German Secret Service, knew all about the plot. It was one of Hitler's secret orders. By the 1st of September, 1939, if possible, an absolutely irreproachable cause for war had to be created. One that would stand in history as justification and would brand Poland in the eyes of the world as the aggressor against Germany. Elsewhere along the border, Muller made arrangements for the delivery of more canned goods. In my presence, Muller discussed another border incident in which it should be made to appear that Polish soldiers were attacking German troops. Muller stated that he had 12 or 13 condemned criminals who were to be dressed in Polish uniforms and left dead on the ground at the scene of the incident to show that they'd been killed while attacking. For this purpose, they were given fatal injections by a doctor employed by Heydrich. They were then also to be given gunshot wounds. After the assault, members of the press and other persons were to be taken to the scene of the incident. A police report was subsequently to be prepared. The Gestapo's stratagem worked faultlessly. Within hours, Hitler denounced a total of 21 supposed border incursions by Polish troops. 
Am Tage der Danziger Freiheitskundgebung hatte der Führer die Männer des Deutschen Reichstags einberufen. Vor aller Welt verkündete er, Polen hat heute Nacht zum ersten Mal auf unserem eigenen Territorium auch mit der Reich regulären Soldaten geschossen. Seit 545 wird jetzt zurückgeschossen. The newsreels triumphantly amplified Hitler's battle cry. 1. September, Überfall auf Reichsgebiet. Die Stadt Beuthen wird von polnischer Artillerie beschossen. Zwei Bewohner getötet, 35 verwundet. Das ist der Krieg! It was indeed the beginning of war. And not only on the Eastern Front. Only hours previously, Great Britain had reaffirmed its solidarity with Poland and would inevitably be drawn into the conflict. This is exactly what Hitler intended. He was militarily well prepared and the Gestapo had been working towards this moment for many months. For Hitler was not just taking his army to war, he was taking his police force. Designated trains carried Muller's men to the eastern frontier, a total of 131,000 officers in all. They were organized and led by the Gestapo. For this was the start of their new role, quelling opposition in occupied territories. In Hitler's ground plan, tanks and soldiers were only the beginning. Their work was to begin at once. The police waited with the army at the border. Among them was Heinrich Barb. Every day around 4 p.m. we left our Gestapo unit so as to be at the border on time for the war to begin. The war machines were already rolling. Of the Polish army, there was nothing to be seen. As the German armed forces swarmed across the border, squads of police and SS security officers were ordered by the Gestapo to complete the first task, which was to liquidate the entire local leadership structure. From there, they moved onto the streets, and local police units were drawn in to help them. Normal ID checks, became an instrument of political oppression. Anyone who didn't fit the Gestapo's approved profile of acceptable citizen was arrested on the spot. Political protesters, so-called parasites, the intelligentsia, and above all, the Jews were rounded up en masse. In the German press, the role of the police was played down, but abroad, the truth was starkly reported. The key difference between the behavior of the Gestapo abroad and the behavior of the Gestapo in Germany is that it's more ruthless because it's targeted on the uh, foreign resistance and on the foreign ideological enemies, above all the Jews, but also Poles and Slavs. The Gestapo trademark was unmistakable. The strategy was to encourage the Poles to indulge a long-held inclination to anti-Semitism, denouncing and attacking their own countrymen, and in effect, doing the Gestapo officers' work for them. Those arrested were immediately deported to newly assembled concentration camps in the east, modeled on Himmler's original camp in the outskirts of Munich, Dachau. The combined power of the Wehrmacht and the Gestapo was overwhelming. Within weeks, Warsaw fell to the Nazis. I was shocked at what had become of the beautiful city I had known. Ruined and burnt out houses, starving and grieving people. A pool of dust hung over the city, and everywhere there was the sweetish smell of burnt flesh. Everything was quiet. Warsaw was a dead city. The Gestapo had proved its worth. From the moment Warsaw capitulated, it would be the key to German control over all their newly occupied territories and form the bedrock of all further Nazi expansion. But the Gestapo, for all its success, was still quite small, and its intelligence, though extensive, largely second-hand. When the Gestapo failed, it failed spectacularly, as a lone bomber's attack on Hitler was soon to prove. 
Am Vorabend des 9. November erfolgte das ruchlose Bombenattentat auf die traditionelle Führerkundgebung im historischen Bürgerbräukeller. Der Führer hatte die Versammlungsstätte kurze Zeit vor der Katastrophe verlassen. Wäre die Kundgebung wie üblich verlaufen, so hätte der Mordplan sein Ziel erreicht. The explosion was the heroic act of a lone anti-fascist assassin. The Gestapo had not known about it or expected it, nor had they detected the planted bomb. It was a spectacular failure. Even for the Gestapo, apple of the Führer's eye, recovery from such a disaster would not be easy. The Gestapo were at a loss, but without knowing it, they had struck lucky. At one of their routine border controls earlier in the day, they had picked up a man attempting to cross into Switzerland. To their surprise and relief, they had the assassin, Georg Elsa, already in custody. Heinrich Müller conducted Elsa's interrogation himself. He was determined to redeem the reputation of the Gestapo and take sadistic and lingering revenge on Elsa. Müller's lips were compressed and there was a malevolent expression in his small eyes. Then he said very gently, with great emphasis, I've never had a man in front of me yet whom I did not break in the end. If Elsa had been given some of the medicine he had had from me earlier on, he would never have tried this business. That was Muller, the little Munich police detective, who now had practically unlimited power. Muller subjected Elsa to what was called an intensified interrogation, the Gestapo euphemism for torture. In addition, his entire family was arrested. Arrest of kin, it was called. It was the latest Gestapo accomplishment. No one knew where these unfortunates were. They were not permitted to send to their relations any indication that they were still alive. They themselves had no idea where they were being kept. They deliberately spread the word that all relations of traitors were being executed. They knew very well the panicky terror this would create amongst all those who'd ever had oppositional ideas. Nevertheless, in the end, the Gestapo conceded that Elsa had been acting alone. He was not executed, just in case he might still prove useful. Instead, he was imprisoned in Sachsenhausen concentration camp as Hitler's special prisoner and later transferred to Dachau. The swift resolution of the Beer Hall bomb episode went some way to rescuing the Gestapo's reputation. But ultimately, its saving was that Müller, Heydrich and Himmler had made themselves indispensable. Together, they had an iron grip over the entire German security network and without their skills, Hitler's large-scale objectives would have been placed in jeopardy. For, as the Reich expanded across Europe, the Gestapo went with it, playing a pivotal role not only in the suppression of political opposition, but in implementing Hitler's cherished ambition, the elimination of the Jews. The plan was proceeding smoothly throughout Germany. SS Untersturmführer Kurt Lischke, who had proved a great success in dealing with Jewish affairs in the Berlin Gestapo, was assigned to continue the task in Cologne, there, he soon filled his cells with dissident suspects and began work on a scheme to deport all the Jews from the city, some 12,000 people. But before he could finish this job, he was assigned a new posting. Having demonstrated his efficiency, he was placed on the shortlist for one of the posts of combat administrator. These were the Gestapo chiefs in the occupied countries. Their mission was to introduce tried and tested Gestapo methods to the suppression of resistance abroad. Lischke was given Paris. He installed himself at once in splendid offices in the Rue des Saussets, a name that would become infamous in French history. Exactly as he had in Cologne, he made the Gestapo in France into an organization of fear and dread. There were fewer willing informers in Paris than at home, so Lischke faced more of a challenge. There was a growing, well-organized resistance movement in France. Its attacks were carefully targeted, and its successes, together with widespread anti-Nazi propaganda, kept French pride alive, and so kept the Gestapo very busy. 
Despite Lischke's attempts to maintain his officers' morale, Paris was not an easy posting. Some of Lischke's problems arose from fellow Germans who opposed their government and had gone abroad to try and defeat it. Among the anti-fascists in France was Peter Gingold. It was something important and symbolic. Through our activity, the French knew that not every German was a Nazi, not every German was a fascist. There were other Germans too. Gingold altered his appearance and assumed a new identity. Under the name Pierre Gombert, he and his wife joined the struggle against the Nazis in the area around Dijon. His job was to distribute pamphlets aimed at the German army, a high-risk activity that didn't last long. I was arrested by a Frenchman and then immediately handed over to the Gestapo. Gingold knew the Gestapo would torture him to make him reveal everything about his organization, but he was prepared. I was brought here with four Gestapo men. I wanted them to put me in front of this door. That was a trap that I had somehow prepared before, to run into the house and to escape through the other side. You see, we lived opposite, and I always had to go to the bakers there, going through this house. It has a passageway through, and there opposite was the bakers. That's how I knew this house that made my escape possible. I knew I was running for my life. I went out through this door and down the street to the right. That's how it was. Gingold escaped and returned to the resistance. He altered his appearance again, this time adding a pair of spectacles and a moustache. The Gestapo never caught him. Others, such as Jakob Leonhard, a Swiss double agent, were not so lucky. I was woken in a panic by a stabbing pain. As I tried to sit up and open my eyes, someone hit me hard over the head. There was a blocky SS man standing by my bed. Behind him was another one with a machine gun. Get up, you pig, he shouted, hitting me in the stomach with his cosh and winding me. They hauled me from my bed and ordered me to get dressed, beating me all the while. Took my passport and belongings and searched me for weapons. For a moment, I thought the one with the machine gun was going to shoot me on the spot. But the other stopped him. No, don't. We have to take this one in. I was bleeding from my mouth and my nose and my face was streaming with blood. And my head was already swelling up. I could hardly move. They dragged me to their car and drove me at top speed through the city, stopping at a house with a sign over the door. Secret State Police. Gestapo. Leonard was taken into protective custody, the Gestapo euphemism for political arrest. He protested his innocence to the interrogating officer. Herr Leonard, he said, you know we have methods which will certainly make you give us a confession, but I insisted I have nothing to confess. They blindfolded me, and straight away they started to shove the back of my head so that my face slammed into the wall. My glasses shattered, and I felt a stabbing pain in my eyes. I staggered back, but they wouldn't give up until I collapsed, unable to move. With brows torn, cheeks split open, and a broken nose. Helene Moskiewicz was a Jewish resistance fighter working undercover in the Brussels Gestapo office. The word cellar had frightful connotations at the Gestapo. It was a, a torture chamber worthy of the Inquisition. I heard loud screams so heart-rending that I lost my head and impulsively ran down towards their source. The room to the door was open, and inside were two torturers stripped to the waist, whipping a man who lay chained to what looked like a butcher's block. His swollen body was beaten to a pulp, a mass of deep gash-like welts and bleeding sores. When the torturers saw me, they stopped in astonishment and demanded to know what the hell I was doing there. I snapped that the man's cries could be heard from upstairs, and what was the point of beating him to death if he wouldn't talk? In Paris, Kurt Lischke had been given a new assignment. He was ordered to begin the campaign to deport all the Jews from France. 
This was a job he felt he could do really well. When Paris was ultimately liberated in 1944, the Gestapo had no time to destroy their records before hastily quitting the city. The mountains of abandoned documents are a testament to Lischke's industriousness. So I'll get his file. It's a very heavy file. And show you that he was in charge of the Gestapo in France from 41 to 43. It's a proof that the Jews who were under German authority were sent to be exterminated without delay. So here are Lischke's initials and his signature. He's read this document, and that's it for Lischke and the Jewish question. Donc, voilà ce qui concerne Lischke dans dans la question juive. As a first step, all the stateless Jews who had fled to France were to be arrested. There weren't enough Gestapo officers to accomplish this. Their neat solution was to give the task to the French collaborationist police working for Vichy. In the documents that we have published, and all these books about the final solution of the Jewish question in France, we know today that 90% of the Jews in France were arrested by the French police, under orders from the German occupiers, of course, and here the Gestapo naturally had a very, very important role to play. In total, 80,000 people were held at Drancy transit camp under Gestapo orders before being deported from France to Auschwitz. But there was always more work for the Gestapo to do. They would soon be organizing deportations from all the nations of Nazi-occupied Europe. It was 1941, and the war was going well for Hitler. The majority of the German people, intoxicated by the glory of his victories, continued to support the Nazi regime with enthusiasm. Half of Europe was under German control, and many people dreamed that peace would soon come with all the European nations united under the swastika. But Hitler had a different dream. Far from seeking peace, he planned to extend the war and launch an attack on his most hated enemy, the Soviet Union. And he was eager to complete a policy already begun, the extermination of all the Jews across Nazi-occupied Europe. The Gestapo had been dealing with the Jewish problem for some time, but in a piecemeal fashion. They had already hit on one idea to simplify matters, to give undesirables identifying labels, for instance, yellow stars for Jews. The beginning of 1942 saw Heinrich Müller, chief of the Gestapo, en route to an important conference outside Berlin. Reinhard Heydrich, Hitler's right-hand man, had received the instruction to start all necessary organizational, practical and material preparations for a complete solution for the Jewish question across the German area of influence in Europe. Complete solution actually meant genocide, and the Gestapo and the police forces they controlled would put it into practice. Adolf Eichmann was the Jewish specialist at the Reich Security Office. Eichmann was a, an Austrian Nazi who rose through the ranks of the SD in Berlin to become one of the leading figures in the Gestapo by the war. He's often been painted as a typical faceless bureaucrat who has no commitment to anything beyond the discharge of his own functions. But I think it's important to recognize that Eichmann is anything but an automaton. Eichmann was also an ideological believer who did things not simply because he was told to, but because he was a, a fervent anti-Semite too. Eichmann took minutes at the conference, as he later recalled during his trial at Nuremberg. Reinhard Heydrich managed during the Wannsee conference to get everyone to use such expressions as kill, exterminate and eliminate, and have their statements recorded in the minutes, pinning them down. Heydrich then decided what was going to come into the minutes and what wasn't. And then he polished it up a bit, and that was that. The Führer had ordered the extermination of the Jews, that's what Heydrich told me. And then, unusually, he paused for a long time as he wanted to see the effect his words would have. At last, the plans were agreed. 
just as if this were an ordinary administrative task of a civilized government. After the conference was over, Heidrich, Müller, and my own insignificant self sat down comfortably in front of the fire. Not to talk shop, just to have a rest after the long, exhausting hours. The importance of the conference, though, was that the fact that it was how the methods of the implementation of the final solution was decided upon by, it must be said, a bunch of second-string bureaucrats. Not, not the top Nazis, not Himmler, I, uh, Goering, Goebbels, etc. Heydrich's the most important person there, and Eichmann's acting as his aide-de-camp, he's taking the minutes of the meeting. But uh, the importance of the conference is it's the discussion of the implementation rather than the decision to do it. That had been taken some time before. Eichmann sent out the conference conclusions marked Express and Top Secret to all Gestapo and police services in the Reich. This was the official order that triggered the final solution. The apparatus was systematically prepared. Rounding up and transporting millions of people was a complicated business. The Gestapo responded, as it had in the past, by drawing up lists, lists of names, millions of human lives that were to be terminated. It was the Gestapo's role to round up the Jews in every locality and to ship them away. They would write to the Jews of any given community at the appropriate point, tell them to assemble at the station, typically, from whence they'd then be deported. And it's also the Gestapo which is at the centre of organising the deportations overall. So it's the Gestapo which liaises with the Reich railway system to coordinate the transports by train to the east. The Gestapo drew upon all assistance available to them. Jewish resistance fighter Helene Moskiewicz had infiltrated their ranks. I can't describe the fear I felt as I stepped inside the dreaded Gestapo building that morning. Until that moment, I hadn't really appreciated my position. A Belgian Jewish girl in the role of a German Fraulein, flanked by an Obersturm von Führer, the colonel in charge of the Brussels Gestapo, walking down long hallways, quietly past guard after guard, being greeted by the rapid fire of Heil Hitler salutes and clicking heels. One of Helene's jobs was to prepare the lists. As usual, the Gestapo got underlings to do the work for them. The notice proclaimed that a reward of 40 Belgian francs was to be given to any citizen whose information led to the arrest of a Jew. When the letters began to pour in, they were referred to our office by the sergeant. Eventually, we had to place some of the mail on the Oberstub on Führer's desk, where they accumulated until a higher decision was made. Thanks to all these delays and to the fact that few Jews stayed long in one place, a number of those reported were able to change their hideouts before the Gestapo reached them. But too many failed to get away. On one of the lists was the Mai family from Würzburg, including Ludwig, the father, Mili, the mother, and their 12-year-old son, Herbert. One day a letter came telling us to be at such and such a time at the concert hall. We're allowed to bring one suitcase and a little food or some such. And my parents have obeyed. They didn't say, we're not doing that. You, you didn't do that. You did what you were told. So all the Jews in Würzburg went to the hall early in the morning without asking why or for what. That was the Gestapo. Everywhere across the Reich, the Gestapo supervised the removal of Jews. Neighbors and friends looked on but saw nothing. I'd say that people simply looked away. They wanted to be able to say later that they didn't see anything. But they did see it. They just didn't want to see it. In many cases, these neighbors would have turned the Jews in themselves. Though, at least in Brussels, there would be some retribution. And after a while, the informers began calling to collect their 40 francs. 
we decided that each informer would need an appointment to collect his money. This enabled us to write down the names and addresses of the informers, which we wrote on a list to be relayed to the resistance, to be filed for future reference and retribution, sometimes even after the war. As instructed, the 850 Jews of Würzburg gathered at the concert hall on the 25th of April, 1942. They waited for further instructions amid the familiar signs of normal life. There were posters up for the following night's concert, a sold-out show featuring Wilhelm Strienz, a singer of sentimental songs. For those who assembled here, this was the last they would see of anything either comforting or normal. Few would ever see their homes or their homeland ever again. 1942, and the Gestapo throughout the Reich and its occupied territories were frantically busy organizing deportations. In Würzburg, 852 Jews had been summoned to assemble outside the town's concert hall. The supervising Gestapo officers made an album for their own entertainment. They made captions mocking their victims. The longer the day, the finer the guests. The best looking among the chosen people. Sarah has to do some work for once. In the waiting crowd stood the My family. We were there overnight or two nights. One morning it was just, get out. And we were marched off through the town to the railway station. My parents continuously uh, instilled in me that everything is okay. Don't worry, child, you're okay, we're here and, and uh, tried to, to uh, which they did, I, I was not afraid because they took care of me and they were there and, and everything will be fine. And I believed that and I didn't think of anything bad. Planning was, as ever, thorough and meticulous. The concert hall was divided into different sections for men and women. Families were split up, never to be reunited. Gestapo officers supervised the whole undertaking, some of them in plain clothes. Oswald Gundelach, the senior criminal assistant at the Würzburg Gestapo, also took part in the deportation. In 1922, he had joined the Bavarian Provincial Police Force, and then, in 1933, the Gestapo. Later, he was to claim that he was transferred against his will, and that all the tasks he fulfilled were perfectly normal and acceptable policing duties. Gundelak was ordered to accompany the 852 Jews to the railway freight station. A total of six deportation waves were sent out from this station, 2,063 Jews in all. The operation ran like clockwork. Most of the passengers believed they were going to be resettled. The my grandparents were on the second transport from Nuremberg to Izbica in Poland in March 42. I know that the father of my mother accompanied her right up to the collection point at Langwasser Station, where they were then deported. I must say, well, we thought they would be put together in a ghetto somewhere and maybe there would be the possibility of coming together again later. Oswald Gundelak's special evacuation transport train, number DA49, lumbered through Germany on its way to the Lublin district of Poland. It took a painfully slow four days to get there picking up more and more deportees en route. Gundelak's report recorded the special train's journey in typical bureaucratic style. The transport was delivered complete. There were no incidents. No police action was required, it stated. His report was handed to the local Gestapo officer. The officer then sent a telegram direct to Adolf Eichmann confirming the arrival of Gundelak's transport train in good order. Gundelak's task ended at Izbica. He was free to return, but not so his consignment.
Izbica is a tiny village south of Lublin in eastern Poland, near the Ukrainian border. It was at the heart of Operation Reinhard, a special operation direct from the desk of Heinrich Himmler. The aim was for two million Jews to be exterminated in this area of Poland. Izbica was set up to be a transit ghetto because it was situated conveniently at the junction of the rail network that linked the death camps at Belzec and Sobibor to the south and Majdanek and Treblinka to the north. Himmler himself paid a visit to the village. The place played an important role in his vast project. At his side stood the local Izbica Gestapo chief, Kurt Engels. Engels began his career as a policeman in Cologne. In 1940, he arrived in Izbica as the local Gestapo chief. Engels was a brutal sadist. For recreation, he used to ride around the village on his motorbike looking for Jews to shoot. Uh, um, I, in a workstadt. I worked in a garage. And um, when Engels came to Izbica, when Engels came to Izbica, he had a motorbike, a BMW. He came into the garage where I worked with a friend, Wolf. So I had to clean his motorbike all the time. But he found people, Jews, every day, and took them up to the cemetery and shot them. They said about Engels that he couldn't have breakfast before he'd shot a Jew. Early each morning he'd run out of his house and run around till he saw a face he didn't like. They said he always laughed when he shot. On the evening of the 28th of April, when Gundelak's train from Würzburg arrived, it was Engels who received the consignment of deportees. However, Itzbitzer was already full, and a backlog further up the line prevented him from sending the trainload of human cargo onto the death camps. Engels thought of a simple solution to his problem. He organized and took part in the mass shooting of several thousand Jews who were on the train. The Mai family survived this savage onslaught, only to perish later in labor camps. Herbert was the only one who lived to see the end of the war. Back in Würzburg, the Gestapo kept meticulous accounts. Every expense was rigorously logged, down to the last fennig. This particular transport, including transportation costs, guards, travel, overnight expenses, and electricity, was invoiced at 52,933 Reichmark and four Fennig. That's about 130,000 pounds in today's money. Working together, the Gestapo and the police force combed German-occupied Europe to deliver more loads of human beings to Izbica. Over the following two years, one and three quarter million people were transported to the death camps via this route. It could not have been done without the zealous work of the Gestapo. But very soon, a blow would fall that would shake all the Nazi security forces to their foundations. May 1942. Reinhard Heydrich, head of the Reich Security Office, was rewarded for his fervid loyalty to Hitler by being posted to Prague as a Reich protector. In other words, absolute ruler. The glory suited his vanity, and he had devised a straightforward solution to the stubborn Czech resistance that he encountered at his new posting. He simply let the Gestapo off the leash. They made hundreds of arrests and, at Heydrich's bidding, carried out summary executions in the streets, making a big show of public slaughter. But the Gestapo became overconfident, and the crackdown had the opposite effect of what was intended. Resistance hardened. Heydrich wrote to his office in Prague Castle in a convertible flying his personal pennant. One day, Czech resistance fighters threw a bomb into the open car. The Reich protector was wounded, but not killed outright. A passerby called an ambulance, and Heydrich died later in hospital. The Gestapo, once again, 
and failed in the most public and humiliating way. Heydrich's assassination sent shockwaves reverberating through Germany. Tausende und Abertausende, vor allem Angehörige der schaffenden Bevölkerung, defilieren im Ehrenhof der Prager Burg an dem Sarg Reinhard Heydrichs vorüber. His loss was greatly felt by the Nazi leadership. Hitler was furious that he'd put himself in a position, um, an unguarded position, that he could be assassinated. But I would say that amongst the Nazi leadership, there was also a terrific sigh of relief, because here was somebody that was feared even by the Nazi leaders themselves. Um, they all thought that this person was so ruthless um, that uh, nobody was safe from him. Heinrich Müller, the Gestapo chief, had to take charge personally once again. The intelligence failure was addressed without delay. The investigation was carried out with all the resources of modern detective science. The official directive stated that the assassins were members of the Czech resistance movement. Many suspects were arrested and all known hideouts raided. The reports read like the script of an exciting film. In the absence of specific hard evidence, the Gestapo chose a saturation approach to punishment. 13,000 Czechs were arrested in the next days and 600 executed. In the village of Lidice, all the men were shot in a 10-hour massacre. The women and children were deported to death camps. Days later, another village was razed to the ground. Through the ruthlessness of the Gestapo, 120 members of the Czech resistance were rounded up in a small church in Prague where they were besieged. I went to see Muller. He said, tomorrow we take the church. Let's hope the murderers are with the ones inside. The next day, an all-out attack was launched against the church. Of the Czech resistance fighters, not one fell into German hands alive. A floodgate of revenge had been opened. While Hitler buried Heydrich in Berlin, violence and terror spread through the East. The Gestapo and regular police forces involved in Operation Reinhardt were diverted in order to take part in the massacres. Among their number was Oswald Gundelach. Later, he insisted that these were carefully coordinated operations against partisans. Die Redelsführer der Bande werden ihrer gerechten Strafe zugeführt. Befehlsausgabe. Es geht um die Bekämpfung von Banditen. Der Sicherheitsdienst hat die Schlupfwinkel erkundet. Nun gehen Einheiten der Polizei zum konzentrischen Angriff vor. Verhör eines Bauern. Er gibt Auskunft über den Weg zu dem gesuchten Bandennest. In breiter Front wird das Gelände durchgekämpft. Lublin in Poland. In November 1943, Operation Harvest Festival was launched. Up until the days of the Czech massacres, the Gestapo had not been systematic executioners. They had simply delivered their victims into the hands of others and washed their hands of the matter. But in Operation Harvest Festival, they were confirmed in their new role as murderers. The Gestapo killed 43,000 Jews in Lublin. Gestapo units had turned into death squads. Individual officers describe their new tasks in their letters and diaries. If the victims didn't want to do what they were supposed to, they'd be beaten. Many of them came quietly to the execution spots. They had no choice. It was always so strange as the victims fell into the ditch. They didn't fall over in the same way, but sometimes rocked, sometimes fell in irregular order into the ditch. I'm not fond of shooting defenseless people. Even if they're only Jews, I prefer open combat. Well, good night, my sweet. The war had wrought a change in the tightly run, clinically organized Gestapo. The unblinking extinction of human life had become routine. A door had been opened. Gestapo brutality was primed to spiral out of control as its focused attention turned to scrutinize Germany itself. <laughs> <laughs>